really strange happens. Um, two colors is the worst possible. So let me let me explain what I mean by that. Um, this is due to Galvin. Um, for any number of colors, we have this arrow statement, um, which I will I will define this in a few slides. But what what's the idea here? Um, so it's the same as our previous arrow statement, but now there's this new subscript, this um, this second uh, subscript two here. And so all that says is that we cannot get down to one color, but we can get down to two colors. So I start off with an R coloring of pairs of rationals. I can find a substructure, order isomorphic to rationals, getting down to two colors. And one could ask, what about coloring um, more like um, larger tuples, not just pairs? So if I color n tuples, there's an analogous result. Um, so what, what, what's the attribution here? So Laver um, proved that these numbers exist, and then Devlin actually found them exactly. Um, so whenever I color the n tuples, of the rationals, I can find a substructure isomorphic to rationals where I get down to T sub n many colors. And this T sub n by, um, by Devlin's work is known exactly. It's the nth odd tangent number. Um, so those numbers go like um, 1, 2, 16, 272, they grow, they grow rather quickly. I think they grow about the size of um, roughly 2, two n factorial um, is how fast those TNs grow. So I wanna talk a little bit about how Devlin actually, um, I guess both Laver and Devlin, how they actually um, prove this result. So where, where can these bad colorings come from? Um, one way to produce such uh, colorings is to identify, let's identify Q with the binary tree, uh, which we order lexicographically. So then whenever I have a finite subset of rationals, um, I can think about the finite subtree it generates. Um, so this, this is sometimes called an envelope. And so these envelopes, you can color a tuple um, based on the envelope you get. And it's interesting to study this coloring. Um, and so, so some types of envelopes um, can be avoided, but some cannot. So then you need a, um, so, so this gives you a bad coloring, but then you need to show that it's worst possible. So you need some sort of Ramsey theorem on trees, uh, which is provided by Millikan's theorem. Um, and Millikan's theorem is proven inductively using a theorem uh, called the Halpern likely theorem. Um, and strangely enough, this inductive step, you have to prove a more complicated inductive step. Um, you have to prove something about products of trees um, to obtain Millikan's theorem, even for just the, the single tree version of Millikan's theorem. You need this, um, you need to boost it up to the product version uh, to get that induction to work. Um, so it, it's a it's a difficult theorem, but elementary proofs do exist. Um, Milken's original proof, in particular, I'm a big fan of. Um, so just to um, have a picture, here are some envelopes of triples. Um, so these are um, two of the um, colors you would obtain when you when you do this coloring based on um, envelope. And what would an, so these are both unavoidable. 
what would an example of an avoidable envelope be? So you can avoid anything where um, interesting, where something interesting happens at the same level. So you'll notice here that there are roughly five interesting events. Um, so where I see a node, where the nodes meet, I think of those as a level where something interesting happened. And these interesting events all happen at different places. And you can actually, you can avoid, um, you, can, you can imagine I could have these two blue nodes, maybe um, what would happen if they met at exactly the level of this other blue node? That is an envelope, but it's an envelope we can avoid. We can pass to um, a copy of the rationals inside this binary tree that avoids that shape. Um, but you can't, you cannot avoid um, envelopes where these events happen at different levels. And so if you start drawing little trees like this for triples, you would see that there are 16 such trees. Um, for four tuples, you would draw 272 such trees. So somehow these exactly characterize um, uh, the extreme colorings. Um, let's see, are there any uh, questions about this example before I launch into the general definition? Right, if not, um, here is what we're doing in more generality. So if I have an infinite structure and a finite structure embeddable into the infinite structure and some numbers L and R, uh, we have this arrow statement uh, with the two subscripts here. So starting with an R coloring, I can find an embedding of the infinite structure K into itself so that the number of colors um, I see inside that subcopy is at most L. And what I've indicated here in purple, um, you, you can ignore it for now, but it's a it's more of a philosophical point. I like to think about this um, embedding as acting on the coloring. So I start with the with um, the coloring gamma. I act on it using this embedding and obtain a new coloring. You can think about this coloring gamma dot eta as zooming in to the copy defined by eta. Um, so that that's a helpful um, philosophy to keep in mind. Um, but you can also just think of it as um, how many colors do we see on that copy um, at most L. And so I define the Ramsey degree of A in K is the least such L. Um, the least such L where this happens for every R, um, but it's a, I don't have to worry about every R. I only have to worry about um, L plus one. Um, there's sort of a standard color fusing argument. Um, if I knew the result for L plus one many colors, and you hand me an R coloring, I just fuse some of the colors together, and then inductively I can whittle away colors until I get down to L. And so um, there's this question, which infinite K do I want to color? So we saw in the, in the first statement of the infinite Ramsey theorem, we were coloring, um, you could either think of that as like a countable set or the um, order of order type omega. We saw that that was very different from considering um, the rational linear order. Um, so which, which of those should we consider as the infinite structure we think about? Um, and the canonical choice is going to be the Freisig. So just some very quick background on Freisig classes. Um, 
These are hereditary classes of finite structures with joint embedding and amalgamation. Um, but I wouldn't, don't worry too much about that definition. Every class of structures I've mentioned is a Freisig class. So this isn't um, too exotic. Freisig classes are ubiquitous. Um, but we will care about these Freisig limits. This is going to be our canonical choice of countable infinite structure. Um, so starting with the class, I can assemble the members of the class into uh, the limit structure. Ah, and I have a, um, a cue to draw a picture. I, I gave a version of this a few days ago um, uh, in person at UCST. Um, so I do not have a chalkboard to draw a picture, but the Freisay limit is characterized by this so-called extension property. Um, so, for instance, what is the generic triangle free graph? Um, if I have a finite, um, one finite set over here, one finite anti clique over here, I can find another point that has edges to everything in the anti clique and no edges um, to everything in this blob over here. Um, so that characterizes, for instance, the Freisay limit of triangle free graphs. Similar extension properties characterize other Freisay limits. And so this is what we will mean when we talk about big Ramsey degree. So if I talk about a member of a Freisay class having big Ramsey degree, I mean, in this sense, um, it has Ramsey degree L in that Freisay limit structure. Um, and then we can talk about a class having finite big Ramsey degrees if every member has a finite big Ramsey degree. Um, so part of the reason I started off by talking about generalizing the finite Ramsey theorem is just to sort of draw a contrast um, compared to the finite Ramsey theorem. Um, up until recently, far less was known about classes with finite big Ramsey degrees. Um, but here are some examples. So the infinite Ramsey theorem, the ordinary Ramsey theorem, really says something about finite sets. You have to fiddle around a little bit with like, um, are we coloring embeddings versus copies? But you could you could phrase this as saying a set of size n has big Ramsey degree n factorial in the class of finite sets. Um, n factorial comes from the n um, permutations of that finite set. Um, this result of Devlin says that the class of finite linear orders uh, has finite big Ramsey degrees. Uh, likewise, finite graphs, uh, finite distance ultrametric spaces, uh, finite linear orders with a labeled partition into finitely many pieces. Um, so what is in common with all of these examples? So all of these, um, the proof goes um, by coding these structures as some sort of tree-like structure. We saw that um, looking at the rational linear order, we coded that using the infinite binary tree. And a similar tree works for all of these examples. Um, so once we start forbidding things, that becomes a lot more difficult. So let's think about the class of finite triangle free graphs. Um, it's much harder to code this as a um, tree in a natural way. So some known results of Komyath and Rodel show that vertices have big Ramsey degree one, um, i.e. if I partition the vertex set of the generic triangle free graph um, into finitely many pieces, one of those pieces contains a copy of the generic triangle free graph. Sauer showed um, the result for edges, um, they have big Ramsey degree four. If you, if you look at his paper, he would say two here, 
Um, but there's there's some um, different conventions in the literature about coloring copies versus coloring embeddings. Um, when you color embeddings instead of copies, you have to multiply by the number of automorphisms. An edge has um, two automorphisms, so two becomes four for me. So um, that's all that's going on there. And then there's a recent uh, huge breakthrough due to Natasha Dobrynin, um, which ap appeared a few years ago, but it um, it just appeared in a journal um, last year. Um, so the the class of finite triangle free graphs has finite big Ramsey degrees. So no matter what finite triangle free graph I start with, um, I color the embeddings of that finite graph into the generic tri triangle free graph. I can find a copy um, all of whose embeddings receive um, few colors. And then the same, um, she generalized this to the class of K clique free graphs as well. Um, so this was a this was a big breakthrough. And I want to talk about um, how her proof goes. There are three major components. So you have to code the Fricey limit as some sort of tree-like object, um, which I mentioned is is this step is already more difficult than before. Um, it's hard to forbid things um, using a tree-like object. Um, you have to prove analogs of these tree Ramsey theorems. Um, so we had the um, the Millikan tree theorem which was proven inductively using the halprin likely theorem. Um, so that needs to be proven. And then you have to argue that these abstract tree theorems tell you something about structures. They actually translate back to results um, about coloring embeddings of triangle free graphs. So all three of these are difficult, but Two, step two here is the heart of the proof. Um, it is a um, very um, technical proof. It uses um, ideas from forcing. It uses the erdos rado theorem. Um, so, so yeah, so to prove this um, countable Ramsey statement, you are um, considering objects of size up to Beth Omega um, so it's a it's a really non-standard proof. It, it's a it's a lot of fun. I, I think it's fun. Um, if you talk to the people in combinatorics, uh, they might think it's less fun. Um, and um, just to mention that um, her proof for forbidding um, cliques of size at least four is is quite a bit harder than for triangle free, um, just because this really this first step becomes trickier, and then that cascades and makes the um, following steps trickier as well. So that's going to be um, a, the starting point for um, the first main theorem I want to talk about today, um, which we can think of as a binary case of an, an infinitary Neschatural Rodel theorem. Um, so, if I have a binary language and I look at the class of um, L structures that forbid um, cert a set of finite irreducible L structures, a finite set of finite irreducible L structures, um, then this class has finite big Ramsey degrees. I will mention so. So it's not quite going to look the same as um, the Nesetro-Rodel theorem. Um, the Nesetro-Rodel theorem does not have this restriction that we only forbid finitely many things, but it seems like this might be essential. So ah, I, I also point out that the proof works the same for any um, F. Uh, so for instance, it, it's no harder to forbid um, K cliques than it is to forbid three cliques in this framework. Um, and, and so, yeah, just to point out, um, Sauer has examples 
where if you allow f to be infinite, you may not have finite big Ramsey degrees. Um, so there is a chance that this restriction to um, only letting f be finite is essential. We don't quite know. Yeah, so it is open whether there is a binary class forbidding infinite forbidding things um, where you have finite big Ramsey degrees. So that is open. So the proof of this has the same general outline as um, de Brennan's proof. What would we have to do? We have to code the limit as a tree-like object. We have to prove some tree Ramsey theorems, um, so analogs of Halpern, Likely, and Millikan uh, for these tree-like objects. Um, we will still use some of these non-standard techniques, um, forcing an Erdős-Rado to make that happen. And then we have to translate back from tree Ramsey to structure Ramsey. Um, do the tree Ramsey theorems actually say meaningful things about um, coloring structures, coloring embeddings of structures? And so the, the main difference is that the tree-like objects that I use are um, way simpler than in Dobrynin's proof. And so that's, that simplifies all three parts and sort of unifies them as well. Um, and I will point out that parts one and two, um, I don't need, so um, what, what's being referred to here, um, that restriction to forbidding only finitely many irreducible structures is not essential for parts one and two. That only shows up in part three. This is a, this is a pretty natural point to stop and ask uh, if there are any questions. If not, I will um, actually talk about these three um, points in a bit more detail. Um, Wait, maybe maybe I have a question, Andy. Um, okay. uh, this. Um, the fact that you're forbidding only, um, uh, how do you call them? Um, you're always forbidding irreducible L structures. Yes. This is this is in order to have a, a Freise class, or yeah. So it's it's um, it it gives you a Freise class, but it gives you something much nicer. Actually, you obtain a free amalgamation class. Um, so when you forbid um, when you forbid irreducible L structures, you get you get a free amalgamation class, and um, that actually is important for the proof. Um, so so for instance, you can you can talk more generally what happens if I forbid things which are not irreducible. Um, sometimes you don't get a Freise class. Um, sometimes you do, but it, it might not be um, free amalgamation. So a good example is the class of um, linear orders, for instance. Um, so in the class of linear orders, you forbid two points which are not related. Um, so that's a non-irreducible structure um, that is forbidden. Um, similarly, for the class of um, finite posets. Um, you can phrase that as forb f, but not for irreducible structures. Okay, thanks. And another question: This uh, uh, your result implies to bring results about the uh, cliques? Yes. All right, because so there you take uh, all well all graph all graphs so. All, so yes, you graphs stack in your your signal, because you say binary structure, so you uh, you gotta say it anyway. mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably wanna say um like all, all forbid um yeah, you, you wanna forbid like all directed edges, you wanna forbid loops, um, and then you wanna forbid k cliques. Um so that's all um that, that fits into this framework.
Um, so I'm going to simplify the talk a little bit. Oh, first, um, before I launch into this, um, let me ask. So at the one hour mark, did you um, plan to take a break or what is the structure? We usually do or anyway, maybe a short break is good, but if you want to go on, go on. Okay, no, it, we might reach a, um, that'll be like 15 minutes. Um, that, that's actually a pretty natural um, stopping point. Okay, so 15 is good. 10, 15, yes. Okay, 10, so this, no, 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 not now, later. You will announce it then. Yeah, I'll, I'll announce it. And you think it's good, okay? <laughs> All right, so um, let's okay. get into some of the details. Um, so I want to talk about how we code L structures, how we're going to think of it. So I, I'm going to say that there's only one unary predicate, um, just to keep things a little simpler. So I have some binary relational symbols here. And I will assume that we have coded our L structures in such a way that every pair is going to have some opinion. Um, so every, um, every pair um, which is not a, an equal pair, has some relation. And I also assume that if I know what the relation is from A to B, then I automatically know what the relation is from B to A. So like if I have a directed arrow from A to B, I know that B receives an arrow from A or something like this. Um, just to simplify the coding. Uh, and so the relation R0 will play a role of no relation. Um, so this is how I interpret free amalgam, irreducible structure, et cetera. So um, an irreducible structure would mean all of the pairs have a relation um, strictly greater than zero. And so when I have um, K many relations, I want to think about the um, K branching tree, K to the less than omega. Um, and I'll use, I'll use um, just to avoid excessive um, superscripts, I'll use some of this shorthand notation. So I have tree T, um, the tree T at or below level N, um, the tree T on level N, et cetera. Um, so that notation is pretty intuitive. And so a coding tree is going to be a tree, um, just an initial segment of this tree, um, and some function that picks out one node on every level, up to level, um, uh, on every level below n. And whenever I have such a function, I get an L structure. Um, where I can see, um, I just read off which relation I, I have based on um, how the coding node corresponding to B passes the level A. So I, I have an example drawn on the next slide. So what we will see an example of a coding tree. Um, yeah, and so any, any L structure um, whose underlying set is um, a natural number or omega um, can be coded by a unique coding tree, which I think of as the tree um, equipped with this coding function that picks out a special node on every level. So, so here's a picture of such an object. So this would code a graph. Zero ref refers to not an edge. One refers to an edge. And so if I look at um, these four coding nodes here, I can read off what the structure is. So for instance, the second node here, it passes level zero um, by um, a one. And so that is an edge. Um, here, this third node passes level zero with a zero, and so that's not an edge. This There's no edge between um, this node and this node. However, it passes level one um, at one, so that is an edge. 
And likewise, for this top node, we have an edge down to the second one, but not to either of these two. Um, so is this, um, is this picture clear? Um, yeah, so this is, this is the manner in which we can code uh, more general structures. Um, so this is, this is already different than what we were doing for the rationals. I want to point out that there, every, um, we treated every node as coding some point in the rational order. And here we're kind of picking and choosing. I'm, I'm designating a special point on each level um, to code um, the nth point of my enumerated structure. So that's going to, we will see that the existence of coding nodes is going to make our lives complicated. Um, we won't see that yet, but just keep that in mind. The coding nodes become problematic. So if I have a, um, a free amalgamation class of L structures, um, if I have a Freistay limit, which I've enumerated somehow, I think of, so when I talk about enumerated structure, I just mean the underlying set is um, omega. Um, I wanna think about enumerations with a special property. Oh, is there a question? No, okay. Um, so I want to enumerate K um, in a special way. And so there's, there's this notion I introduced called being left dense as an enumerated Freise structure. And so what does this mean? So I have some, I have some initial segments. I look at the Freise structure um, on the first M points. And then I have some type over the first M points. I have some, some type that's compatible with my Freisei class. And I want to realize this type somewhere in the Freisei structure. Of course, because it is a Freisei structure, I can realize the type, but I want to realize it. Um, so everything up to, um, here, so before the purple, everything up to here is just being a Freise limit, so nothing special. What is special is I want to realize this type introducing no unnecessary non-zero relations. Um, so if, I'm, if this is a type over M, um, so I'm going to realize this type um, on vertex mm -hmm. um, F of M, and I want to demand that um, f of m and n uh, are unrelated for every n um, in this interval from m um, up to f of m minus one. And so that is not true of every enumerated Freise limit, but there is an enumerated Freise limit with this property. Um, it, it's it's pretty easy um, if you if you are patient and just ask, well, I need to enumerate this type introducing um, nothing, you make it happen, you can construct such a left dense K inductively. Um, very similar to how you would construct an ordinary Freistate limit inductively. And so we're gonna fix this once and for all. We, we choose an enumeration with this property that will stay fixed now for, um, for all time. And so, um, just a notational um, remark, I will drop superscripts uh, when referring to that. And what I will actually show is um, what, what, we, what, what is actually um, addressed in the paper is um, not the Ramsey degree of the structure in the limit, but the ordered Ramsey degree. So I think about, I think about equipping um, the Freise limit with this enumeration order. And I think about equipping A with some enumeration. Um, and, and so you can translate back and forth. If I figure out these ordered Ramsey degrees, you can figure out what the, um, original Ramsey degrees are supposed to be. Um, 
So, so this, um, this is not a loss of generality. Uh, all right, and so we want to think about how these trees, um, how to work with these trees. So what sorts of maps from these trees into themselves should we consider? If we're, if we're leading up to a tree Ramsey theorem, I need to know what sort of maps I have on trees. So a starting point is this notion of strong similarity. Um, so I'm going to ask that a strong similarity, it's an injection, it preserves meaning on the same level. So a level set maps into a level set. It preserves um, meets, it preserves tree order. It preserves passing number. Um, so you definitely want something like this um, if we're if we're using our tree to code structures. Um, so we want to um, preserve passing number. And then I have all these coding nodes, so I need to address the coding nodes as well. Um, so I have this extra uh, condition saying that what is an embedding of the coding tree for A um, into the coding tree. Remember, this is the coding tree for the Fricey limit. I drop the superscript if it refers to the Fricey limit. Um, and it's, it's what you'd expect. So I just need to ensure that coding nodes map to coding nodes. Um, and so you might think that this seems like the natural choice. Unfortunately, it is not going to work. So I think I will show you the next picture. And then that might be a natural time to take a break. Um, so what's the, what's the problem? We want some sort of extension property uh, for these uh, coding tree embeddings. So if I have a smaller coding tree, if I have two finite coding trees, one extending the other, and if I have an embedding of the smaller into the coding tree of the Freisei limit, I want to extend that. Um, to um, the larger finite coding tree. And that's not going to be possible with this definition. So here is a, here's sort of a problem. Um, in the case of triangle-free graphs, what is going on here? I have um, the first two levels of the coding tree of the Freisei limit. Um, Let's say that A refers to just the first level and B refers to the first two levels here. So because we are quoting a triangle-free graph, note that above um, extending, so this is, this is the node, um, this over here would be the node one, one in the binary tree. And extending one, one, we find no coding nodes. Why is that? Well, as, as written here, um, there's an edge between vertex one and vertex zero because it passes with a one. And then anything up here would have an edge to vertex zero and an edge to vertex one. That is a triangle. So there are, because we are forbidding triangles, there are no coding nodes up here. If I just look at um, just kind of the, the simply coding tree that just has um, one level and this single coding node on level zero, I can map it to this coding node on level one. And locally, that looks fine. That is an embedding of this small coding tree. But it will not extend. Um, because if I were to extend it, I would have to map um, this node somewhere in the forbidden blob. And there are no coding nodes uh, to map this point to. So that's, that's the sort of problem that we need to solve. Um, but I think we can solve that after the break. Okay, so we resume at uh, in uh, 15 minutes, so at 7. Five. 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 So at uh, at five, five one, and one or two minutes. Okay. okay.
Okay, it looks like um looks like people are um settling back in. Um right, so before the break, I introduced the problem that shows up if you try to use this naive definition of coding tree embedding. Um we we fail to have this extension property that we really want to have. So um, the, there is a solution, and this is sort of the, um, the heart of how to generalize, how to get a general framework for all binary free amalgamation classes. So we have to add some extra structure to these coding trees. Um, something similar does show up in uh, Dobrynin's work. Uh, she has this notion of um, parallel ones in the triangle free case, um, pre a clique in the k free case. Um, so, so generalizing this, but with a much uh, with, with a streamlined framework. So we have to keep track of how structures can appear above the level. Um, and so I, let me introduce uh, this class um, a K of S. So if I have if I have a level set in my tree, um, I say that K of S denotes all of the possible coding node configurations that can appear above um, the nodes in this uh, level set S. Um, so, for instance, going back to this picture, um, I would endow, I would enrich the singleton one one here with the empty class. Um, so I would I would keep track of the fact that there are no coding nodes above um, this node. Um, and then it's but it's it's more than just what's above a single node. You have to kind of keep track of the interactions as well. So I have a, a picture, um, ah, and then the, um, so the aged embeddings, uh, so I call these, so, so sometimes these classes K of S, I call the age sets. Um, and so aged embeddings are embeddings that respect this additional structure. Um, so maybe to give some intuition, I can describe what's going on in the um, triangle free case. So in the triangle free case, what is going on is that every level set of the tree gets an additional structure that looks like a graph. And this graph is going to keep track of whether edges are allowed between coding nodes above um, certain points. Um, right, so what, what's going on in this picture? So, here I have the triangle free graph. And unlike in my last picture, I'm going to assume, let's say that we started the enumeration so that vertices zero and one are not adjacent. So um, that's why one is um, to the left of zero. And so if I look over here, what sorts of configurations are allowed which are not adjacent to zero or one, well, I can have any triangle-free graph appearing above here. Um, above um, these nodes, so here, for instance, I'm asking what sorts of configurations are allowed um, where I have uh, no edge to vertex zero, but yes, an edge to vertex one. Well, if Every node up here has an edge to vertex one. I cannot have edges up here because if I have an, an edge up here, each of those has an edge to vertex one. That is a triangle. Um, but I am allowed points. And so for all of these, I'm allowed points. And then something um, um, new happens where I actually have to care about what happens um, between these blobs. Um, so, for instance, it is allowed 
that I could have a coding node here and a coding node here that code an edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would not be allowed um, over here, let's say. What's going wrong over here? Well, both of these blobs, um, vertices um, coded by coding nodes in these blobs, all are adjacent to vertex zero. So I cannot have any edges um, even spanning the blobs because then that's going to code a triangle with um, coding node, coding node, and then zero. Um, similarly, up here, both of these blobs think that they are adjacent to vertex one. And so I cannot have an edge uh, between any two nodes here because then I would have node, node, one, and that would be a triangle. Um, and so it, the aged, um, the age set structure, as I call it, it just keeps track of all of this information. We're just going to keep track of what is allowed to appear. Um, and so notice in a, this in a crucial way um, uses the fact that we are in a, um, a class of the form. We're thinking about a class of the form Forb F. Um, so we're sort of keeping track of how how close are we to accidentally constructing a member of the forbidden set? Um, so that that's what we keep in mind. So whenever I I construct something forbidden, i.e. a triangle, I have that's what I have to worry about. And so then we can prove um, we can prove tree Ramsey theorems for these um, for the trees with these embeddings, these aged embeddings. And so this is the, um, the precise form of the Millikan theorem. Um, so if I color the aged embeddings of a finite coding tree into the Freisei limit coding tree in R colors, I can find an aged embedding of the whole thing into itself where I get down to one color. This is proven, in, so this is our analog of Millikan's theorem. Inductively, um, you prove it inductively using this um, messier looking theorem. Um, so this is an analog of the Halpern likely theorem. So um, I don't want to, I don't want to worry too much about the details here, but the idea is that um, we would, um, we would think about proving the top theorem one level at a time. And so in this theorem, I have one more level to deal with. I freeze everything in my tree at below this level of interest. And I think about I think this last level can map. And I color those, those one level extensions. And I need to prove a Ramsey-like theorem for these one level extensions. And so, so that's all that's going on here. You use um, you use this to prove the um, the Millikan theorem, but the the top one is what's important. That's what's actually used. Um, so, just a remark: if you drop the coding nodes, and if you only care about strong similarity, um, then we this actually is Millikan's theorem, and this actually is the Halpern Likert theorem. So this this directly generalizes. Um, these existing tree theorems. Um, and I will mention that the Halpern likely theorem is, um, it is a forcing an Erdős Rado argument. So that doesn't go away. Um, but it's, it's cleaner. It, it's, it's easier than Dobrynin's setup because our tree objects are simpler. Um, so in particular, um, Dobrynin's proof uses forcing multiple times. Um, there are at least three instances in her um, triangle free argument, for instance, that use forcing. Um, and in my setup, this is the only place that uses the forcing. Um, and so this this remark here, um, I will actually mention that this is this last remark about finding a classical proof. Um, this is work actively in progress uh, that is joint work with several people. Um, all of whom I will mention um, later when I mention another joint work. Um, so this is 
Um, this, this last part, finding a classical proof is actively happening. Um, and we are, we're, we're almost there, um, having a fully classical proof of this tree Ramsey theorem. So once you prove the tree Ramsey theorem, you have to, um, there's this last step, you have to argue that the tree Ramsey theorem tells you something about coloring um, embeddings of structures. So, yeah, so we need to translate. So if I'm given um, a structure Ramsey problem, I'm given a coloring of embeddings of a, a finite structure, I need to turn that into a coloring of um, aged embeddings of coding trees. And so we do that using this notion of um, closure. So I will say that a finite subset of um, the Freistay limit is closed. So think of this, so I, I, I call it a subset of the limit, but think of it as a subset of levels of the coding tree. Um, so I'll, I'll make that distinction, or I'll, I'll sort of blur that distinction um, from here on out. So a subset of levels of the coding tree, or really just a subset of the structure is closed, if there is uh, some uh, finite A and some aged embedding so that those are the levels I pick up with that aged embedding. Um, and closure is just the smallest closed set um, containing S. So it's a little bit non-trivial to argue that closure exists, um, but it but it does. Um, you you could, there's actually a fairly hands-on procedure to produce closure, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but for now, let's just let's just say that it exists. The closure of finite sets will be finite. But the problem is if you want a bound on the colors. So so more or less, what's going to happen? Um, when I when I use the tree Ramsey theorem, um, I get down to one color per each um, type of closure I get. So I look at different finite subsets isomorphic to the same finite substructure, and I look at the possible closures I get when I do that. And I can get lots and lots of different shapes of closure. Each of those will correspond to a color. And so if you want to argue that you get finitely many colors, i.e. finite big Ramsey degree, you need a uniform bound on the size of the closure in terms of the size of the set you started with. And here is a picture. Um, so triangle free graphs again, that's uh, the, the running example I'm, I always work with. So what's going on in this picture? So I, I start off with a single level and which I think of as this single coding in my coding tree, um, what sorts of things happen when I compute its closure? The idea to compute closure is to, um, to start at the top and scan downward and then throw in anything interesting that happens. Um, when I come to an interesting level, I throw in that coding node and then continue my downward scan. So because we are forbidding things, because we're forbidding triangles, um, it makes the left branch interesting. So hitting the left branch becomes an interesting event that we have to keep track of when we compute this closure. Um, so here I'm computing the closure of the single coding node and I go down, I hit the left branch and then that's interesting. So I have to throw in the coding node on that level. And now this coding node is going to do the same thing. We scan downwards, and then this coding node hits the left branch. That's interesting. I have to throw in this coding node. So you can see that starting with a single node, I can really get this like cascade started where I can pick up an arbitrarily large um, finite closure. And that, that's a problem. We need, to, we need to mitigate this problem. The way we do that, is um, pictured over here. I want to pass to a, a subset of coding nodes that codes the Freistay limit 
where, um, where we have some control over closure. So what would stop this cascade? We would stop the cascade if um, the coding node, so I, I start over here, I go down, I hit the left branch and that's interesting. So I have to throw in this level. But now if the coding node, if the new coding node is already on the left branch, um, the cascade stops. Um, and so over here, this is, this is the good picture. We want, I want to pass to a subset of coding nodes where this happens. So the solution, we want to find an embedding. Yeah, so this is um, finding a, um, a copy of the state limit. Um, think of it as a subset of coding nodes of the coding tree where um, finite subsets have closures of bounded size. This is where we need um, this is where we need that extra assumption on our um, forbidden set F. Um, this is why we only are allowed to forbid finitely many things is to get this uh, uniform uh, closure. Oh, too far. All right, so now this leads into more recent work, much more recent work. Um, so this in, in recent joint work with a lot of people, um, Balko, um, Kodunsky, Dobrynin, Kibishka, Kineshi, and Bena, um, we sharpen this part of the proof and we actually get the optimal bounds. We get the exact um, big Ramsey degrees. Um, so I phrase it in this form. So there is an algorithm which given, so given a um, Freisig class of this form, given a structure, in that Freisig class, you can run the algorithm, find the exact big Ramsey degree. As a consequence of our characterization, we get something um, which I won't get into the technical definition, but you get something called a big Ramsey structure. Um, roughly speaking, a big Ramsey structure, it's a strengthening of finite big Ramsey degrees where so not only do we have finite big Ramsey degrees, but these sort of extremal unavoidable colorings, we can sort of um, think of those as existing simultaneously for every finite substructure. So for instance, we saw that with the rationals. We saw that if we, um, by passing to a suitable subset of um, the rational order, um, when viewed as coded by the binary tree, um, the extreme coloring for any n-tuple was given by these tree shapes that you get. And so that's the sort of thing I'm talking about when I talk about big Ramsey structure. Um, so just as an example, um, I want to give one concrete example of um, some big Ramsey degrees. Um, I promised exact big Ramsey degrees, so I should give some numbers. So I will discuss the, um, the order um, with respect to the enumeration orders, um, big Ramsey degree of the N element anti-clique in the class of time tree graphs. And it can be described in terms of runs of the following procedure. So let's consider the following procedure for describing um, a, oh, that's a typo, a sequence of finite ordered, um, not necessarily triangle tree graphs. So we start this algorithm with the empty graph. At some future time, if the graph is empty, we may choose stop or continue. Otherwise, we must continue. If at the time uh, we continue, um, I need to produce an ordered graph uh, GK plus one from GK. And we have four choices. Oh, question? No, okay. Um, so, so the next graph can be obtained using um, exactly one of these steps. 
So step one, introduce a new minimum vertex adjacent to all old ones. In particular, if you are an empty graph, um, you will have to do step one. You have to introduce something. Um, step two, I can take an existing vertex and duplicate it. Uh, so the two children of vertices will be order consecutive and non-adjacent. I can delete a single edge, or I can delete a single isolated vertex. So those are my four options. And so I, I'm thinking about runs of this procedure um, where I start with the empty graph, I end with the empty graph, and the ordered big Ramsey degree of the n element antiquique is the in the class of triangle free graphs, it's the number of runs of this procedure with n vertex deletion events. Um, so that is the that is the exact um, ordered big Ramsey degree. Um, what are these numbers? Uh, they grow very quickly. <laughs> so so um, for instance, for um, for the non edge, the ordered big Ramsey degree is exactly five. Um, for um, the three element anti clique, the ordered big Ramsey degree is one hundred and sixty one. Um, it gets very large. Um, so in general, this number, um, something I can say it is at least n factorial times n choose two factorial. Um, so way bigger than two n factorial. Remember that was two n factorial was about the size of the big Ramsey degrees for rationals. So we were growing much faster um, because of the, the forbidden, um, forbidding triangles really makes the envelopes much richer. Um, so how, how do we see that there are at least this many runs? Um, one family of runs is to introduce, you just introduce n vertices, you get a clique of size n, delete the n choose too many edges in whatever order you'd like, then delete the n vertices in whatever order you like. So that is how you obtain at least this many runs. Um, but it would be interesting, I don't know if this is the correct asymptotic. Um, it, the asymptotic, it's at least this big, it could be much bigger, I don't know. Um, so it's kind of a fun enumerative combinatorics problem that I would be interested in seeing. Um, if anyone has ideas on this, I would be happy to see um, the, the, and the, and the exact formula or the, the exact asymptotics of this. Um, so now maybe let me um, talk about um, what's going on more generally a little bit. So we need a better understanding of closure. Um, I promised, I promised a more iterative construction of closure, and we can do it as follows. So, so if I have a subset of the Freistay limit, again, think of this as a set of levels of the coding tree or a set of coding nodes of the coding tree. I'm kind of blurring these distinctions. Um, we get three interesting types of levels. So coding levels are just the levels of A, i.e. levels of coding nodes in the coding tree that correspond to members of A. Splitting levels, these are the levels where two coding nodes from A meet in the coding tree. And then these, these somewhat more mysterious age change levels. This is a result of the fact that our um, coding trees have this extra age set structure that we had to add. Um, so, so it might be the case where the age, the age set changes from one level to the next. And so I have to pick that up as well. That's what's going on. Going back to this picture. In this picture, um, the reason that this level is interesting, for instance, it's an age change event. So the age of, um, so going up, 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 up. Um, I, the age of this node is the class of all triangle free graphs. The moment you depart, it's the age of edge free graphs. So, so that is an age change event. This is an age change event. So that's the sort of thing we're talking about. 
here with this third type of uh, distinguished level. And so then the critical set of A is just the union of these things. Oh, question? Oh, no, okay. And what you can show is that I can obtain closure by iterating this um, critical set operation. So it's the smallest superset that is closed under the critical set operation. So just take a iterate crit until you get nothing else. Um, for finite sets, we know that this stops because um, crit A, you, you won't introduce anything above the maximum node of A. Um, so we know that um, this will stop at a finite time. Um, in if A is infinite, you can still um, you just you just iterate crit countably many times, and then that will be that will be closed. And so when I go from a finite A to its closure, um, the envelope is what kind of records the information contained in that closure. Um, so for instance, we recorded in the rational linear order, um, we formed the closure by, um, in the rationals, it was much easier, I just had to keep track of meets. And then the envelope kind of abstracts that information even further, and it just kind of codes the basic shape of this tree, like where the splits happen, where the coding nodes happen, where age changes happen. Um, so you just, you just code this abstractly. And these are the colors. So this is what we want to um, reduce as much as possible to get a sharp um, upper bound. You want to get rid of as many envelope shapes as possible. So I want a, I want a substructure isomorphic to the price limit so that um, for finite subsets of this substructure D, there are as few envelopes as possible. And this is, this is what we call a diagonal substructure. And the actual definition of this is really technical. Um, I will get into it a little bit, but um, with many omissions, um, it, it's, it's quite technical. Um, in, in our paper, just the definition and construction of this takes like 40 pages, um, <laughs> maybe 30, 30 35. Um, so, so it, it takes work <laughs> to, to define this object. Um, so a, li a little bit about the definition of this object. First, you do something a little weaker. You define something called weakly diagonal. And so I'll, I'll talk about this for k-free graphs. Um, it's a little easier. It reduces to the following. You want your coding nodes to form an anti-chain. Um, so no, no coding node extends another coding node. Um, you do not want coding nodes on the left branch because um, the left branch is kind of special. We want to reserve it for its special um, purpose. You do not want splitting levels. You don't want splitting levels of um, W to be the same as any coding level of W. So if I have a coding node in W and then other um, nodes Think about the other coding nodes above this level and how they pass um, the level of this coding node. I don't want to split right at that level. Um, so I want, I want the splits to happen at distinct places from where I have coding nodes. I want the splitting levels to only have one split. You could imagine maybe I have a splitting level where I have two nodes from W that meet here and then two other nodes from W that meet here at the same level. I, I don't want that. I want only one splitting node um, per splitting level. Um, it should have two children. And when I think about the other nodes on the splitting level, um, they all pass with a zero. Um, so weekly diagonal reports just some basic information about the shape of the coding nodes of W inside the full coding tree. 
once you have this, there are um, many more things that happen uh, between weakly diagonal and diagonal. What are they? There are four extra things that we add. A diagonal substructure is it is weakly diagonal, and it has these four extra properties: um, controlled age change levels, controlled coding levels, controlled splitting levels, and controlled paths. Um, I will not define these. Um, they, they are quite technical. Um, so each of these is quite technical. But the idea is that you want interesting events to happen as gradually as possible. Um, there's also um, a, a philosophy about placing coding nodes is that if, if something could have happened before I placed a coding node, I want that to have happened. Um, so, for instance, we saw this when coding, um, when we were coding um, the n element anti clique. So, what's going on in this uh, construction? So, these G's are, we're, think about scanning up in the tree. And these G's are recording what's happening off of the left branch. And so there's this idea that when I, um, so deleting an isolated vertex corresponds to, that's a coding node. And the fact, oh, question? No, okay. Um, and so demanding that you delete an isolated vertex, um, really amounts to saying that's part of this philosophy that I want the, um, I could have made it isolated before placing the coding node, so therefore I do. Um, so a, a very rough idea of why um, that's happening. Um, as a remark, controlled paths doesn't even show up in the case of k-free graphs, so if you'd like, you can ignore that condition. Um, so for um, three free or K free graphs, it's really just these three conditions here. Um, and then just a very brief word about the lower bounds. I think I think this is my last slide. Um, so so all of all of this work was just to get the upper bound as small as possible. Once you once you whittle down the upper bounds as far as you think you can. You need a lower bound statement. You need to know, um, you need to construct a bad coloring. Um, you need to know that we couldn't have added more conditions to our notion of diagonal substructure to eliminate more envelopes. So what we do is we adapt the argument of Laflamme, Sauer, and Buxanovich, where they characterize exact big Ramsey degrees for the rather graph. Um, and so it's actually, it's not too difficult of an adaptation. Um, it's, it's not, it's not easy, but it's, it's doable. Um, it's it sort of, it's sort of followed from staring at their paper for, for a long time and figuring out the correct way to make that generalization. I want to point out something, um, where, how would we actually, how, how do we actually, um, prove this? How do we come up with our notion of diagonal substructure? Um, in a sense, so the presentation here is the reverse of what actually happened. Um, the first thing that we did was generalize the work of um, Laflamme, Sauer, and Viksanovich, um, to show that certain types of envelopes were unavoidable. And so what do they do? They essentially um, introduce a framework whereby you can inductively show that um, Envelope shapes for finite graphs um, must appear in every um, set of coding nodes that codes a rather graph. Um, so we do we do something similar. Uh, we show that every set of coding nodes that codes a generic um, a copy of the Fresse limit um, has to contain certain envelopes. And then whenever we encountered a type of envelope behavior that we couldn't work out somehow, that 
Um, that would suggest to us some notion to add to our notion of diagonal sum structure. Um, so we would we would say, okay, here's an envelope that we can't quite show is persistent. Let's try to build a diagonal substructure uh, that avoids it, or to refine our definition and construction of diagonal to avoid that style of envelope. And so, and so that's that's sort of the history. Um, the the diagonal substructure came second, and the uh, the generalized LSV came first. Um, and I think I think that is all I have for today. So I will say. Uh, Thank you. All right. So are there questions from the audience or from the chat? We can read it if there are also on the chat. I don't see any for the moment. Wait, wait. Manuel, if you're if you're talking, you're you're if you want to ask a question, your microphone is is off. Yeah, we we put it off because we we have been told that there's a bit of echo. So if like if ah, okay, okay, we okay. just we just turn it off. So uh, <laughs> if 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 no one has a question, I have one. Uh, okay. Andy, you, you, you talked about uh, a big Ramsey structure. Yes. Is, is, this, is, is, there a, is there a connection with the usual Ramsey structure uh, definition from Todorovic? Or is it, is it a name that, or not? It's, um, it is not quite related to, um, to it, it's not related to Todorovic's notion of Ramsey space. Um, Okay. What it is, so I can I can mention a little bit in the world of small Ramsey degrees. So the, those finite um, those finitary generalizations of Ramsey property I talked about at the very beginning. Um, you often think of that as you have your Freisei limit, and then you have some expansion uh, Freisei structure on top of that, and that sort of codes. Um, all of the Ramsey theoretic information of the original structure. So if I have sets, I have linear orders on top. If I have graphs, I have linearly ordered graphs on top. And so that extra structure um, really encodes everything, um, all of the Ramsey property stuff of the original class, and it has a nice dynamical interpretation. So if, if you care about um, topological dynamics, um, that's how you start computing things like universal minimal flow. So, so a motivation for me to define this big Ramsey structure was to do something similar in this um, infinite Ramsey theory setting. So you have your um, your starting Freisei structure. I expand it somehow in a way that records all of the um, infinite Ramsey theory of the structures below. And then because I have just one expansion structure, I can start thinking of this as a dynamical object. I can start allowing the automorphism group of the original to act on this. Um, and then this, this has some interesting um, consequences. Okay, thanks. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. So we thank Andy very much. So uh, I do have a, a, a question. If uh, <laughs> sorry, after the flow. Oh, go on. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, is the um, uh, do you know uh, LGS theorem uh, or Gower's Fink theorem? Are, are they? Um, uh, do you know them? Uh, else, do infinitely, infinitely LGS theorem. Wait, say say again. You you mentioned Gower's Finke theorem, but I didn't yes. address it. Yes. Uh, is that uh, interpretable in um, in uh, in the theory of uh... in, in this sense? Um, it is so. Gower's Finke theorem can be interpreted as a um, some sort of infinite Ramsey theory statement. Um, 
That wouldn't be for a free amalgamation class. Um, it's not clear to me that the infinite structure that you would get, because I mean, because the infinite structure you get would be coding these like block sequences or in a sequence, and it, so it's not clear to me that that's that would be the fry state limit of the relevant class. So that would be more like um, that would be more like looking at the linear order omega uh, when thinking about the class of linear orders. Um, but 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 it, it, you can interpret that as um, as a, as an infinite structure in some sense. Uh, just a, a curiosity. Uh, did, did you read the, the um, what is the opinion uh, about the um, the paper uh, of uh, Rufowski of uh, def definability patterns? Because uh, I have read a bit of it, and I think it's very difficult, and, and it is quite related to this. But uh, <laughs> it. Uh, so, well, I can say I read. I did read through that a little bit. Um, and it is it's quite interesting i think as far as um um the, the the things that i was interested about um like thinking if it had any consequences for mg for gene automorphism group um i don't think it said anything new um so it was, it's more offering a new um, perspective and a new generalization of mg um to other objects i.e um, other theories can have something like an mg um, but, but no, I, I don't think it has, um, I don't think, I would be surprised if one could use that to actually prove Ramsey theorems. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. So I cannot see if there are more questions because maybe another one pops up, but it seems that I'm joking. And, uh, I recall that uh, next week we meet at six, uh, at four, it's, it's at 16 as well. And Sandra Muller, Muller will speak. So, Andy, thank you again and goodbye, everybody, I guess. All right, th thank you. All right, I'll, I, will, I will take off now. Um, thanks for.